everyone, and welcome to Playwright, a podcast about creating and sharing new ways to play. My name is Ryan Heyman, also known as H, and my regular co-host with the hiccups now, yes. <laughs> Ryan Quintel. Yeah, and you can call me Q for the sake of differentiation, but we have a third person with us today, don't You're we? You're not H? alone. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about this magical mystery person. Yes, of course. This is uh, Charlotte Cutts, who is in Germany at the moment. It's kind of cool, an international recording. Uh, not that we've never done international shows before, but I believe this is the furthest away that anyone's been on Playwright at uh, at time of recording. So that's, that's kind of fun. Uh, Charlotte is a member of the... I guess, European podcasting community. Uh, that seems really kind of oblique, but there are a few of us who, who kind of, you know, rub shoulders along the way. And um, I've enjoyed podcasting with her in the past. Uh, she's usually involved in a few different projects. Uh, what are you involved in at the moment? Well, at the moment, I'm doing something super exciting and I'm writing mm-hmm. for um, Destructoid once a week. Oh. So I do... Oh, yeah, excellent. Yeah, I, I do like a... Um, Tend to be like top seven style lists or just commentaries on a specific piece. Tends to be that rather than reviews. Mm-hmm. And um, I've been doing that since October. Yeah, and I'm really enjoying it. So does Destructoid run different content in Europe versus in the Americas? Because I know that Kotaku does. Mm. Um, no, it's, it's fairly blended um, at the minute. Um, there's a fair few of us. I mean, I'm originally from the UK and there's a fair few of us who... Um, are sort of UK based. I'm not really UK based, but you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And then there's those of us who are uh, those of those people who write for Destructoid who are in the US, and we all communicate and sort of blend together very, very nicely. Sounds great. Well, we can look out for that once a week then. What we're here to do today is to pitch brand new video game ideas, things that people have never played before, may never play, but uh, has an inkling of an interesting or unique concept in there and uh let's just uh yeah let's see where it goes q uh what do you have for us out of your wild mind today since our last recording time has been a little shorter than normal and so Mm -hmm. i i started leaning on my colleagues and talking about what ideas excite them and started coming around to this i'm sure it's a it's got to be some other game at this point but it feels like it might be fresh to me. And we can make it fresh. We can make it fresh. (laughs) Exactly. We're going to take it all different directions. I'm trusting that Charlotte has got like, uh, you know, cloudy beers over there in Germany and she's ready to (laughs) freshen this thing up. A game where you are playing a co-op experience and you have one person or perhaps multiple people playing as spies a la Mission Impossible, and then one person who is the control room nerd guy or gal. And you have the spies on the ground, which can identify and track targets, carry out mission objectives, but it's the tech person that has to help you track people via some sort of system, unlock doors, hack into systems. So one side maybe feels more like mini games and, you know, interfaces. And you have to communicate back and forth a la the VR game, keep talking and nobody Mm, explodes. (laughs) That is the pitch, a sort of Mission Impossible-esque co-op spy game. All right, and then we will give ourselves 10 minutes to talk about each idea and just kind of workshop it, see where we can take it. And uh, sometimes even take it in entirely different directions that we didn't expect before. So let's go ahead and start the clock. Uh, The first thing this makes me think of is um, there was a game being shown, I believe. Who was it a part of the Fable universe? I don't think it was ever released, but it was an early Xbox One reveal. I think it was Fable branded, but uh, there were three players that played as adventurers and then one player that was kind of a dungeon master Mm -hmm. uh, who had a different perspective. Um, There's also multiplayer modes in... I believe Rainbow Six games or um, some of those other type shooter shootery type of games where one person plays as somebody has kind of a view of the entire battlefield and then the players are going in and, and trying to overtake bases and stuff like that. And the, the person can give them instructions on where enemies are and stuff like that. So uh, this kind of 
I would say asynchronous because that usually applies to when people are doing things at different times. But this kind of yeah. asynchronous style of play, but all simultaneously happening, like you would get on some of those real clever Wii U games as well. I'm just thinking, what would the, um, so I presume you meant that there would be like hacking mini games. Like, what would that look like? Because the thing that popped into my head when I think hacking mini games is um, that Sly, um, I forget what it is, the Sly. Um, Sly Cooper? Sly Cooper or... for yeah. the, P- the <laughs> PS3 one, PS3, yeah, PS yeah. Vita one. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what those. Oh, thieves in time, yeah, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, wondering what like the hacking uh, mini games would, would, how they would resemble for a Q. What would you. I actually feel like I've gotten a couple good and fresh takes on hacking mini games in 2017 with Nier and uh, Wolfenstein. Mm-hmm. Uh, the most recent Wolfenstein actually had a kind of fun weird like punch card feeling Mm. uh little unlock system there so uh, what i what i really like is this idea of let's even say it's the bioshock like connecting the tube and circuits and you're on a timer or whatever yeah that's really fun there's a really cool version of that in watchdogs 2 where you have to it's kind of like a pipe dream type of uh setup but you have to kind of connect uh, using uh, rotating like junction points, yeah, uh, you oh, have cool. to connect circuits and stuff. But the thing is that they're all over the world around you. They're supposed to be kind of like the wires running through the walls, and so oftentimes you would have to use your your drone to fly around and look through the walls to see them. Or sometimes you would have to yourself run around the world and um, and trigger these different things, get different vantage points and trace these um, circuit lines throughout the the world. So something like that, something like um, like gunpoint is kind of a similar thing, but on a 2D plane. Uh, so I could see something like that working. Yeah, it's this interesting thing where I feel like in any sort of, let's say the, you know, one person playing that uh, on the ground experience feels more like Hitman or something. There is this moment that happens, especially in Mission Impossible movies, where, you know, the person is like hitting the button to the elevator or like going to use a a fingerprint reader or like a retinal scanner. And they're like, I hope this works by the time Mm -hmm. I go to use it (laughs) Uh, because everything has to happen just right. And so the idea of having that sort of over the air chatter between the spy and the tech person. Being like, okay, I, you know, I'm being chased. I need to get into this room. Um, can you get me in? And having that person having to do it in real time instead of like, because of the way games are formatted, they always have to cut away to a mini game and at most give you like a timer or something to fail and keep retrying. But I like that being a sort of separated out experience. I really kind of like the idea of um, having one person in the control room and then um, possibly like five or six different spies. So it's not necessarily local co-op because then that reminds me more of like a time management game. And I really, really love time management mm. oh, games. Yeah. So it, it, oddly enough, that reminds me of all those games I used to play as a kid, like Dyna Dash, where you just, it was all about like timing things down to the microsecond to make sure you didn't fail. And I like... It would bring different elements in if you were playing local with with just one other person, then it would be more about the communication. But if it was like online with six different spies, that would be a, bring a different element to it. What if we also like pulled in some elements of the keep talking and nobody explodes game and mm-hmm. actually make it so that maybe it's it's the spies like every time they go to play a level, these security systems for different rooms are randomized from, mm, you know, yeah. a set of them. And so really the tech person doesn't know what they're going to have to hack or like mm. the way they're going to have to hack it until the spy can be like, Oh, it, it looks like it's uh, this type of thing. It's got a red button on the right hand <laughs> side of it, you know, like, so there's that aspect of, you know, one person is the eyes, right, still, and having that discovery phase, and the other person has to sort of react to and guess at what's going on. Having restricted information. There's a game called Republic that was mm-hmm. originally put out on um, iOS, I believe, uh, but eventually came to PS4 and Steam, at least maybe other platforms. It's a stealth game, kind of like a Metal Gear Solid, except you're not playing the main character you're playing the person that's advising them Mm -hmm. where to go and so you can you can tap a location in the environment and you can advise her to move there but it's still her making her own decisions and 
uh, you know, just kind of relying on you. Um, but you can interact with things in the environment. You can lock doors, you can turn off lights and stuff, kind of like in Watch Dogs again. Uh, but the clever thing about it, also like Watch Dogs, is that you're kind of confined to security cameras that you can you can move in between because you're a hacker that's not there in the environment. And so right. having those restrictions in what you can see and where you can be at any given time uh, would be really helpful. And it would also kind of, you would probably have like a paper map of the environment. So you kind of know the overall shape of where this, uh, of, of what the uh, building looks like, but maybe you can yourself take notes on where things are and as you're zipping between cameras and uh, and trying to help out all of your your friends and trying to manage between the three of them, you know, where do I need to be at any given time and what's the best way to get there and how do I keep an eye on all of the guards? Um, almost like uh, Five Nights at Freddy's, like trying to keep track of where is this enemy between my multiple cameras at, at any given point in time. There are blind spots that you might lose them in. There are you know, you just have to keep a good awareness of your environment. I just had a very quick idea. I don't know why, but my mm. brain jumped to let it die. And the whole idea of like trying to um, get as far up a tower as possible with all of these threats oh, getting yeah. <laughs> harder and harder and harder. And I was just thinking that maybe oh. um, the threat instead of being like all these monsters would just be the security system. And the goal is to try and cooperate, to try and get as, as far up this, um, I don't know, Nakatomi Plaza style building as quickly as possible <laughs> and get as far as you can kind of thing. That's really cool as, as kind of like introducing that roguelike sort of gameplay aspect to it. I wonder, because one of my favorite, uh, I, I'm always so inspired by like how movies set up these fictional worlds and then it seems impossible to pull off. But I wonder, one of my favorite parts of The Matrix was that scene where Neo's on the phone with Morpheus, right? And he's telling him exactly when to, you know, jump, you know, turn mm -hmm. left and goes forward and wait three seconds and all that sort of stuff. And Destiny 2 has some of that stuff in its raid where one person kind of has to look, be up at the top and observe while they direct the group of people who are on the ground. And I think that that would be really cool if you're racing to finish this plaza or whatever, that there's that timing aspect of it too, where mm -hmm. I'm looking through a security camera and I go, okay, I know this guy is making his rounds and he's going to be on the right hand side. So you're going to go left in three, two, one. So same way we have to count down to sync a podcast for God's yeah. sake. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be interesting as if you had to choose when to exit the tower is that if you keep on going until you're all dead, then you lose all of your rewards. Mm. But you can choose at any time to take either the elevator back down or to jump out of a window and glide away. And so that way you kind of cash out your, uh, your prizes, your money that you've acquired to that point. Um, and then also maybe you're sharing your total takeaway between however many people are left. And so you're always kind of suspecting that your friends might be ready to betray you and shoot you when, when they're ready to cash out. Or if you cash out and they keep going, then they're only sharing the remaining floors uh, profit between the two of them. And you have to settle for a lesser amount. But at the same time, maybe they'll get killed and you're safe with yours. You've, you've banked it. So yeah, that could be a be a fun addition. Yeah, that sounds really cool. H, you love betrayal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> like those mind games. Uh, anyways, we're out of time on that one. We have to give that one a name. Uh, Q, do you come in with a name for that game? I don't, but I love Charlotte's uh, Nakatomi Plaza. Uh, yeah. idea. So maybe we can get some other gibberish name for a plaza that we could put in there. Or or tower is a good way because that. It gives the idea of ascension as well. Plaza, I always think of as like the flat portion. Oh, of yeah, a, that's true. Hmm. Yeah, let's do something tower. We could do like a like tower of cameras or heist tower. Collaborate tower is really bad. Conspire? Yeah, because like a like a spire, that's that's also like a word for... If we just called it conspire and spelled it S-P-Y. And the S could have be like, it could be con and then capital S spire. It's all the things. It's a spire. It's a spy. It's a con. <laughs> a spire is a tapering structure built on a roof or tower. So it's not a million miles off. It's like a church spire. 
I mean, maybe then <laughs> that's the whole thing. You're trying to get to the spire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Robbing the world's largest church. <laughs> Anyways, conspire. I like that. Let's go over to our guest. Charlotte, what kind of game do you have for us today? So my idea for the game is based on the fact that I love the idea of dance games, but I can't mm-hmm. really play them because um, my knees are quite bad. So I notice whenever I play something like Just Dance, it's like pushing me to throw shapes that I'm not very comfortable with. <laughs> and generally, I'm just not a good dancer. So my idea for a game was like a cross between um, a rhythm game and a traditional dance game, where instead of having to throw specific shapes, instead you have to hit um, dots that appear on the screen or like showers of um, shapes mm. that appear on the screen or even on the very very easy modes you just have to sort of move your body into a, like a certain region on the screen and um, music's playing like in a licensed music like in Just Dance um, and this, the screen is sort of like deducts points if you stop moving but there's no pressure to like throw specific moves except perhaps in the harder difficulties. Generally it's just a game that I would mark it as a dancing game for people who um, are probably not that good at dancing. So I'm like more of a, <laughs> like just mm-hmm. dance is a casual dance game but I still feel like you, there's an idea that you have to be able to throw the shapes that are on the screen. So yeah, so sort of like um, a rhythm um, dance game, sort of with like dots appearing a bit like how in the Hatsune Miku. Um, rhythm games, yeah. how they appear across the screen, it would kind of be like that. Yeah, so that's my starting point for my pitch. Let's start the clock then. A uh, couple of reference points here. There's a couple of VR rhythm games. I believe Audio Shield is one of them, and I'll have to I'll have to look up the others. Where you are, instead of dancing, you've got a bunch of dots coming towards you that mm. correspond with music, and then you're using your VR motion controllers as like shields to block them or to hit them back. Oh, and, interesting. Uh, so that's, that's one way to kind of give an alternate uh, view of, of of rhythm dancing type of games. And also there's a, this is a long story, but I, uh, back in high school, there was one time where uh, I got a bunch of friends together and we all pitched in like, you know, $5 or something really minimal and just went out to GameStop to just find the cheapest Wii games that we could find. And we ended up coming home with um, some sort of a National Geographic, like Arctic adventure game, <laughs> as, as well as High School Musical 3 Dance. Oh, God, oh, my wow. sister had that game. Oh, God. <laughs> this is a real game? Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was actually kind of impressed by uh, the way it works is that there's two uh, kind of a radial shapes on either side of the screen. Uh, they almost look like the uh, the health bars from Goldeneye. <laughs> they have like a upper, middle, and lower quadrant points that like dots and then move towards, uh, kind of like the um, Hatsune Miku or the uh, Persona dancing games. As they reach that point, that signifies that you either have to move your Wiimote or nunchuck up like you're flipping eggs in a um, in a frying pan to the side, like you're throwing it out sideways, or downwards like you're hammering a nail and we actually found that you know that even though it's not you know approximating real dancing was engaging enough a way to uh, to play through those very silly songs and uh, actually had a lot more fun with that than i expected that i would (laughs) now h i can't believe you didn't reference the first thing i thought you were going to talk about which is (laughs) fantasia music evolved Oh yes, good point. <laughs> this was uh, yeah. That's a that's a rock band like game, uh, also produced by Harmonix, but it's set up for the Connect, uh, which has you subbing in for the composer, uh, not the composer, but rather the conductor mm-hmm. of a symphony instead of a uh, of a musician like you would in rock band. But it's a lot of swinging of the arms and stuff like mm-hmm. that. I believe uh, Child of Eden was also kind of a similar idea back on the PS3 and Xbox 360. But yeah, let's, let's see if we can take this in a different direction and see where we can uh, evolve into un, untread, untrodden territory. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the idea of a game to, to some of what Charlotte was saying is a dancing game for being kind of rubbish at dancing, right? Mm. <laughs> so uh-huh. I think that while some people are kind of bad at dancing, maybe a dancing game that could actually help and guide you into learning how to just kind of move or sway your body to the beat of something. And so if there were maybe, you know, it's hard to 
not think of connect and those type of accessories to like track mm-hmm. you in some way mm-hmm. um, when you're doing this. But if there were like bars kind of a little bit to the left and right of my silhouette or like in this virtual space where I just have to kind of sway and make sure like my hips or my arms are hitting them at any given point. And then you could maybe even bring in some, uh, I don't know if you guys have played Thumper. No. Thumper kind of has, it's a, it, it is kind of a music rhythm game that, has just kind of moments where you're supposed to throw yourself to the left or right. Using a controller, you're not actually, it's not a motion controlled one. Yeah, that's true. And kind of as long as you're on the correct side when the, well, it's a turn and thumper, but in when the note or the beat hits, um, you kind of get credit for it. So it, it may be a, a dancing or rhythm game that actually is like, teaching you the fundamentals of like moving your body to the left and right in time with music. Mm, Yeah. You know, what I'd be really interested in is I don't know exactly how this would work, but utilizing the different capabilities of uh, the switches, Joy-Con controllers is maybe like trying to find certain rhythms in your environment somewhere. (laughs) And uh, I, I guess there's not a lot looking around my home that is moving, but Uh, Like if there was something with repetitive movement, like a washing machine, uh, trying to find, it gives me like a certain rhythm that I have to find something that I can put the Joy-Con on top of that does that rhythm over and over again, or point the Joy-Con camera at uh, a flashing light that is in that rhythm. Or, uh, you know, maybe it just, I have to uh, make those own rhythms with my own hands and arms and you have to find some sort of a creative way to invoke those rhythms in the real world and uh and if in different ways it would request different things of me almost like a uh, like a bop it would give you different like you use the camera use the buttons use the motion to do these um these complex series of rhythms yeah that sounds cool what if we take something like that and Okay, hear me out. Now we have the Switch. We're talking about Switch. We can use HD Rumble to probably approximate something like auxiliary percussion, like a shaker or a tambourine. Mm -hmm. And so now kind of you are a little bit more, your hands and wrists can can move to the beat and kind of do the more fine dancing work where like your offhand or something is just for the sort of dancing motions and it can be a little bit more general and forgiving whereas like as long as you're hitting the beats with your tambourine or your maraca or whatever Mm -hmm. god now you can actually play the cowbell in a game which i would really (laughs) really enjoy there's a lot of dances that are very like wrist oriented like belly dances have a lot of uh wrist movement and very precise kind of like hand stuff going on to be honest hearing that description just makes me want to have um a switch version of samba de amigo (laughs) that's probably not too far off i think I think there are rumors, at least, of something like that happening. Mm. I mean, like, I never played it, and I also never played any of the Donkey Kong um, bongo games, mm. but I always really wanted <laughs> to have them, so that would be an excuse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's that uh, Taiko Drum Master that's big in Japan as well, but I've never mm. played it. I don't really know what that one entails. Let me ask you this, Charlotte. Do you see as this this game is potentially like your typical going through a list of popular tracks or do you see it more like experimental where your movements and your body can like create rhythms and sounds that you're just figuring out how to combine with each other. So it's a little less structured game points and a little bit more like physical music lab. In my head, it was more the first one, but I could see it being a combination of both. I mean, um, my starting point when I imagine this game would be that it would be something that people who um, have um, injuries or um, problems Mm -hmm. um, with their joints like me um, could play. And like, for example, with Just Dance, there was that um, the Rasputin dance where it actually encourages you to do a Cossack dance. And I was like, oh, my God, my knees Mm. are going (laughs) to die. But this is this is more like um, just encouraging you to find your own movements, but you just have to hit these certain points. But um, with the more like harder difficulties, it could definitely progress into something where it's more like um, like some really experimental tracks, like I don't know, um, some, I'm trying to think of really experimental artists, but like Bjork, for example, could be some of mm-hmm. her tracks. And you, then it does progress into more of like a, a, a sound lab 
sort of um no and Bjork, sort of she would she would release her next album as this game right <laughs> like that's true <laughs> <laughs> I've been really into games that are about creation of music. Um, Like uh, Q mentioned previously, the Fantasia Music Evolved. Mm. Uh, Rock Band 4 has freestyle guitar solos. Rock Band VR has a lot of um, freedom in allowing you to change the way that the music sounds. Or uh, even Harmonixes. These are all Harmonix examples because they're kind of the ones that are blazing the trail for this more than anyone else. But uh, Harmonix's uh, card game, uh, Drop Mix has aspects of of mixing elements of different songs and stuff. And so I could see something like this where you are using motion controls to kind of play different instruments. And this is sounding dangerously close to Wii music. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if you give harmonics something like this and they tell you, you know, this is the this is the bass song that you're playing over. Why don't you tap out a drum beat and it can kind of match your motions to a a loop that can play over the um, over the song and it can kind of understand the rhythmic structure and do little flourishes as well um you can strum out a guitar piece and you can you know it's all about just finding the rhythms in these different pieces and um yeah maybe even choreographing a dance or something like that Mm. Uh, but there's there's a lot of different instruments that could be simulated by motion controls and I'm getting this idea of like, um, this is reminding me of Parappa the Rapper in a way, in that <laughs> may- maybe like um, the more you uh, freestyle and diverge into um, yeah, yeah, the more points you get. That could be an idea. Being able to check if you're on the beat, that's not the hardest thing to program. And so I could definitely see that coming into this as well. Uh, we're all out of time on that one. Ah. Uh, but... Uh, we have to now come up with a name. Uh, Shava, did you come in with a name in mind, or uh, should we all try to create one together? Had a few ideas, but none of them were particularly good. <laughs> that's that's okay. I would love to have something that sounds like it, it you know, is accessible. You know, mm-hmm. like rhythm for mm-hmm. everyone or rhythm for all. You know? <laughs> everybody's rhythm sounds too much like everybody's golf, but oh, that's not <laughs> bad though. Shoot. I mean, really. We music does fit that category, but <laughs> what if you do beat builders? Is that weird? Beat builders, yeah, yeah, I like bad. that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, let's just go with beat builders. That's a that's a nice communal sound to it. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't sound too intimidating, right? Because you yeah. can share your sick beats that you make, <laughs> right. and you can drop beats. Okay, Ryan, <laughs> <laughs> we understand that you're very hip. <laughs> Down with the kids. <laughs> I'm very hip, you guys. You don't even know. We're going over now to our community. This is a uh, submission to our website. And if you would like to submit one of your own, you can do that at playwrightcast.com or you can email us playwrightcast at gmail.com. Uh, we've got probably three or four more of these left. And so if you email in now or uh, post on our website now, then it will be read uh, fairly soon. Uh, we're running a little bit low. And so you guys are always good at uh, filling our inbox back up whenever we're getting low. But uh, just to put that call out now, because it'll be um, it'll be it'll be gone before you know it. <laughs> uh, anyways, this comes from Jason SC, who says, "Happy New Year, H and Q. Thank you very much. Uh, here's a quick pitch for you: a Papers Please type poker game. So the main gameplay would be like a typical poker game with several AI players." But between the hands, you would be given narrative choices, like a crime organization suggests that you lose the next game or else. You could also borrow money from bookies, but if you fail to pay them back, you'll risk losing all your money or worse. And other AI players could be set up as targets, similar to the film Casino Royale, where Bond has to force a criminal to lose all their money. Just like Papers, Please, there would be a daily cycle where after several games, The day ends and your character has to pay for groceries, rent, and other necessities, but your health will go down if you're low on money and can't afford some of the necessities, or if you're beaten up. Obviously, the stakes would be higher if the game went in the spy direction. Alright, so let's start the clock. I feel like there should definitely be in the counter at the end where it says all of your expenses, there should be familial expenses involved. So that it just adds mm-hmm. the, the thumb screws that um, you're here playing poker and your family is in the background trying to feed themselves. 
I don't know. Yeah. I feel like I feel like there should be a level of guilt as to oh my god, why am I even playing poker? I'd be interested if the if there was some level of like a telltale type of adventure game mm. where yeah. these are different or these are uh kind of a rotating maybe cast of characters that are coming in and out of this casino, this kind of seedy, maybe a um prohibition era casino uh throughout the the days or weeks or months that you're playing it and they all have evolving storylines and you know maybe they find themselves in a really bad spot sometimes so it's good to throw a hand uh to give them the the money that they need to pay for an operation or something or if they're in trouble with a loan shark or something like that and so you make these narrative decisions based on how you play the game but it's also it also is a little bit luck based like every round of poker is and so something a little bit more like um uh like what is it called poker night at the inventory that telltale put out but more Mm -hmm. story based yeah i mean it's definitely interesting to have this idea of um because when i when i would think of a poker game i would think i'd want to win at all costs so the idea that you might actually want to (laughs) help out your fellow players so that they don't stab you in the back later or just because you want to play your character as a nice character that sounds pretty cool i mean i hate to keep bringing in movie references this is like the most (laughs) i've ever done but casino royale is a fantastic movie and the idea of being able to have those James Bondy moments and James Bondy new adjective market in the calendar. Those James Bond like moments that, you know, maybe you you did get in trouble with an organization and you're now you're playing a hand like poisoned essentially, right? And maybe you can't see your card straight and so like <laughs> things from the narrative are affecting your ability to play the poker game or you're nervous or you learn things about characters and that gives away a tell about them and so you learn yeah. to understand when mm. your opponents are bluffing. Yeah, as you have conversations with people in between hands, you know, you can talk to them, you can maybe even go and have dinner with them somewhere, and you can kind of learn more about their 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 tells and about their uh, their life situation, kind of give some context to what you're playing. Uh, maybe you can even like gift them a pair of glasses that you can see the reflection of their cards in. Yeah, as a way of like sabotaging <laughs> certain players. I like that. Take these mirror shades there. <laughs> they look great on you. Yeah, you know, you could sell it as like, you know, all the good poker players wear these dark sunglasses so people don't know when they're bluffing, but really this is a rather reflective pair. One idea I just thought of is that um, one of the um, plot points could be that you're part of a um, association, um, a criminal association perhaps, mm-hmm. and... Um, you have to make sure another person on the table wins and not you, but you can't like oh, throw, yeah. throw the game, obviously, because then people will realize you're in cahoots kind of thing. So you're trying to, um, without being able to see their cards necessarily, trying to um, influence the game so that they win without making it obvious. Don't know how that would perhaps work. I'm not the, the most knowledgeable about how, about how poker works, but that would be kind of cool if you were actually trying not to win. Um, You're kind of hustling people. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Or even like, I I imagine maybe there's some way throughout this narrative to figure out potentially what cards an opponent has or come to an agreement with them um, off of the table. And then also like one of the things I love in any sort of adventure game is the idea of like finding collectibles. And so what if you're finding like cards in the environment and you can actually have cards up your sleeve right so like by Mm. finding these things you're like okay well i know i got this ace and i know i've got this queen and that's going to help me get this uh, this great hand and you have to choose whether or not you're going to cheat in those moments and it could be that if you cheat um it involves I like quick time events, so maybe it would be like a quick time event sort of scenario. And if you fail the quick time, you end up in a narrative with somebody who's catching you cheating. And then you have to pick your options really carefully so that you don't get into a massive confrontation about it. And they sort of let the issue drop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What what horror? There was a horror game. I don't know if it was Alien Isolation or what, but there, it was a horror game where you had to like uh, physically hold your controller still. Until dawn. Uh, 
Oh, mm-hmm. until dawn. That was it. I loved that mechanic. And just imagine like, okay, you go to bluff or you go to play a hand or cheat in this moment and people at the table are staring you down and to like hold your bluff, you have to like remain calm and still and icy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not actually aware of that many games who that use that mechanic again. So that would be a really cool way to use it. Yeah. Especially for a poker type game. Mm. Uh, this could again work really well in VR uh, to, to see people's tells really closely and to have that really precise motion control as to how you hold your cards and what kind of affectations you give off. Mm. Um, it'd be interesting to go in a uh, to have like a stable of like six characters that you can choose to play as the entire story from their perspective, and then as you play again and again you get the different perspectives and learn different things about the stories you learn about their own home life and that kind of recontextualizes how you read their actions in mm. in further playthroughs and sometimes the sympathy you have for those characters so um yeah kind of like a uh kind of like a near automata where you're learning things in different playthroughs or like a vagrant story where there's a lot of um stories to tell that you're kind of going between in my head, I'm just um, thinking about how um, in L.A. Noire, all of the facial expressions mm-hmm. were just so spot on, even in the PS3 version, not even the remastered version. Mm-hmm. So it'd be really yeah. cool if there was some sort of that really realistic, um, not necessarily a Telltale style cartoony, squ- um, semi-realistic, but like a really like um, L.A. Noire style, really um, exact facial expression. So you can really see um like whether people are bluffing and or whether maybe some of the characters are uh, programmed to be worse liars than others and their tells are more Mm -hmm. obvious than others yeah that's really cool and especially if you are interacting with them off of the you know outside of the game and you actually see them as opposed to like you know getting unlocked i understand how this person lies um it's more subtle. It's more seeing how they talk about themselves and their life and what their expressions are during those things. Um, and kind of trying to map that to what they're saying and doing inside the game. I also yeah. like I, what you were saying, um, H about like, imagine playing this game from one perspective, manipulating other people at the table and then like playing it from their perspective and learning how horrible it was that you manipulated that mm. person in a particular way. <laughs> like, ooh, I probably shouldn't have pushed that parent angle because now I've learned the backstory of each one of these characters. And that was actually really awful. Having those dialogue prompts during the game to be able to kind of get under people's skin or even to create light conversation during the game. Uh, that was what was so fun about that um, Poker Night at the Inventory, those two games that Telltale put out. Uh, they were very lighthearted, and it was mostly just the characters that were pulled from different games like Portal and Sam and Max that would just talk freely and tell jokes and stuff in between hands. And like that just makes it a lot more engaging, I thought, than just playing poker against you can have a faceless CPU opponent. Yeah, I think so. I think the crux of this of nailing it feels like it's going to make each person at the table feel real. And whether that's through being able to play each of those people at different runs or have a story that interweaves throughout all their lives. Like as you play linearly through that, then you're 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 actually learning about what triggers other people Um And then you take that back to you on the table of like, okay, I played this character already. I know that they have issues with X, Y, and Z and the ability to, you know, kind of call them out or or call their bluff on it as you play the next character, because you're kind of learning how to not just read your opponents, but deeply understand them, right? I think a really cool way to end this game would be to once you've played through everyone's story, you get like one final story that is somebody that's external to the game somehow, uh, but somebody who is the puppet master, so to speak, kind of using all of these characters against each other and putting a lot of these plot machinations into order. Mm. Uh, But the way that it would do it, and I don't have this fully planned out in my mind or anything, but I'm sure that a clever enough writer could find a way to do it, but is to incorporate a lot of the poker mechanics that you use throughout the game to kind of orchestrate a lot of these um, 
these life events that are driving the narratives for all these uh, characters and you know being able to because poker is a lot about negotiation knowing when to use your hand and knowing when to hold and you know i could see that being you know stepping back from the poker table and learning what you've using what you've learned almost like those moments in the witness when you realize that you can use what you learned in the puzzles to interact with the world around you and uh, that could be a really cool kind of final moment for this game i'm just thinking um for a a vague setting for it it could be like um Mm -hmm. an illegal poker game being held in a in a pub or in, in the back rooms yeah. of a bar, and then the um, all the different patrons in the pub from dif- a variety of different backgrounds are the ones who are playing, and then the external um, character could be the the landlord slash owner of the bar who's mm. set up this um, illegal poker game for their own ends and is orchestrating everything. Yeah, yeah, and it'd be great in that kind of prohibition setting as well. Like I love those mm. period piece type games. Uh, but anyways, we are out of time on that one. Uh, that is a, it turned out to be a really fun idea. Uh, mm-hmm. Jason uh, comes in with the title. He says, deal me in, which I think fits with where we ended up going with that. So I'm happy to keep that title. Uh, thank you very much, Jason Esty, for giving us that um, that pitch to play around with. Of course, we are not the final word on that. So if you, Jason, or if you, the community, have anything more to add to that then we encourage you to uh, get in contact with us on our twitter playwright cast or um you know you can comment on any of our previous episodes on our website playwrightcast.com or uh, yeah just kind of keep the conversation going we would love to hear if you have an entirely different way uh, that you would like to take any of our ideas then um you know just drop us an email or something like we'd love to read about that and uh, continue the growth of these ideas and of course um as we mentioned i think on episode one and haven't really mentioned it since all of the ideas that we read on the show we're not trademarking we're not copywriting anything and so (laughs) if you are a game designer and anything in here inspires you at all then feel free to use any of these ideas um you can you can copy them verbatim or you can uh take them in entirely different directions. You know, we're just here to kind of keep the conversation going and to get more creative video games out there. And so, you know, feel free to use, utilize in whatever way you want. Um, Anybody out there, any of these ideas are entirely up for grabs. I was going to make the joke, unless you work at EA, but I think EA (laughs) could use some of these pitches more than ever before. So please, EA employees, take a listen and take something from the show. (laughs) Hey, you know what I like to do when I'm reading all of our users' write-ins and comments, H? Mm. I love to listen to our theme song, Hello World, (laughs) by Proto Dome from the album Blue Noise. It's very good, and you should go take a listen to it. Very good. And of course, thank you to our guest, Shavit Cuts for joining us today. Uh, You mentioned your uh, Destructoid pieces at the top of the show. Is there anything else that you would like to draw our listeners' attention to while you're here? Um, not in particular. I mean, um, I'm trying to, 2018 for me is going to be the big year when I do lots of podcasting, hopefully. Mm-hmm. So you might hear me on a few other podcasts here and there. But aside from that, you can just find me usually every Saturday or Sunday, I write something for Destructoid. And also I'm on Twitter at C Cuts Games. Cool. And that is spelled with two T's? Uh, yes, it is. I had to think for a moment then about my own surname, but... <laughs> <laughs> It's very, it's not that late here in Germany, but it is considerably later on in the day than it is where you are based. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. That's true. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you everyone for listening. Q, why don't you take us out with a little miniature idea to chew on throughout the week? I just want a narrative telltale adventure game where you play as Alan Partridge. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, cool. We'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you.